Um, we'll give a second to welcome everybody to our first digital brown bag lunch talk series of the uh, academic year. Uh, we are very excited to have a special guest, Mickey Kaufman, with us today to present her paper quantifying Kissinger, a talk. Piece of paper. But um, the Digital Brown Bag series is uh, a series of talks where we explore different uh, uses of digital technologies in academia, museum studies, gallery, in gallery use. And so we're exploring a lot of different ideas and topics. And this one, um, a lot of people ask me often about uh, big data projects and our people doing big data projects in digital humanities and do you have any examples and I always inevitably uh, refer to Mickey's project uh, the first time she showed the project it really uh, blew my mind as to the possibilities and the ways that we interact with our history and in, in many different ways because we are constantly now in our current time accruing and, um, and storing vast quantities of data. Um, and it's different data than the data that Mickey is presenting on, but it's, I think, a really uh, good point to look at in our past as a way to reflect on what's happening currently in our changing ways and what kinds of data we're saving, particularly in our current administration. And not as a political comment, but in years from now, we will be digesting that information and that this history, um, our current moment in, in these, in, well, we don't know what methods we'll be using, but I am excited for you to uh, see this project and to think through some of these complexities. Uh, Mickey is coming to us from the Graduate Center where she is ABD, a doctoral candidate in uh, the history department. She uh, earned her BA um, in US history summa cum laude from Columbia University. And she's a co-author of General, I Have Fought Just As Many Nuclear Wars As You Have, which was published in December 2012 in the American Historical Review. In 2015, she was awarded the ACH and the ADHO's Lisa Lena and Paul Fortier prizes for the best digital humanities paper worldwide by an emerging scholar for her dissertation, Everything on Paper Will Be Used Against Me, Quantifying Kissinger. In 2016, Mickey was elected to serve on the Executive Council of the Association for Computers and the Humanities. Uh, without further ado, I'd like you to all welcome Mickey. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, looking forward to getting into the presentation, but to give me an idea of how I might tailor or, or modify what I plan to talk about, if you don't mind, I'd love a show of hands uh, in response to a few questions. How many people in the room are currently students, graduate or undergraduate? Great. How many people in the room are educators uh, in graduate or undergraduate education? Terrific. How many folks have done digital humanities in the course of their work, whether professionally or otherwise? Okay, and how many folks are historians or interested in the history of the Nixon-Kissinger era? Okay, so we've got a rather broad coverage. We've got a fair number of people from each group, so I'll hope that my focus will be broad and will speak to a number of the themes that, that the, each of these sort of different constituent groups might be interested in. Uh, don't hesitate to hold up your hand during the presentation, and I'll be happy to take questions at any time. In addition, I brought the behind the, the scenes, under the hood stuff for some of the visualizations. So if people are interested in sticking around for a few minutes afterwards, I'd be happy to walk you through some of the stuff that we can't get to in the larger session. And last, you're welcome to contact me at any time if you have any questions or are or, or interested in these sorts of applications to your own research or work. Um, so don't hesitate to reach me at this email address or on Twitter. Um, uh, and I look forward to those conversations. So, <clears throat> as Jesse said, my project, Quantifying Kissinger, um, is an attempt to study the way that future historians will study the moment of today. I chose the Nixon-Kissinger era in particular to study not simply because of the technological benefits it offered for that question, but because I'm an historian of US foreign policy and I found that the Nixon-Kissinger era was an incredible inflection point across a wide range of different concerns. 
It is the first time a presidential administration generates what we would call big data, millions of diplomatic cables, hundreds of thousands of memoranda and telephone conversations, many different constituents, each with their own memoirs uh, and other associated materials that they themselves have written. And in Kissinger's case, quite a prolific autobiographical uh, uh, historiography. Um, so for the arguably one of the first times in history, there is too much data for me as a graduate student wanting to pursue a PhD for me to read all of that material in a, what we call a close reading approach. So my research is in fact an application of what we call distant reading, reading which is a computational way of looking at patterns in text in a large scale. Uh, and also networked reading, which is a more complex concept, which is, involves the use of these techniques to identify material that then will be the subject of close reading. Rather than starting at word one and ending at word 5,762,231, you look at the patterns that these visualizations surface and ask questions of the material that are fundamentally different. So that's what I have to show you today. First, a little bit about Henry Kissinger. Uh, he was at the center of world events, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, in the s late 60s and 70s. This is Kissinger with Nixon, Kissinger with Le Docteau, the pr premier ambassador from North Vietnam, uh, Kissinger with Leonid Brezhnev from the Soviet Union, and with Zhou Enlai of China. He was at the center of the most important geopolitical events of the era, and his role in those events is both profound and controversial. Um, it is the complexity in how his policies and how his personality are not only uh, described by historians, but how he himself has maintained that legacy that is interesting to me. But culturally speaking, he's all across our map. Um, at the time, Newsweek saw him as Super K, a phenomenal new diplomat who would change the game. And DC Comics pictured him as the kind of guy who'd fight with the Teen Titans for freedom in America. Whereas Marvel Comics saw him as the guy who would have been on Dr. Doom's side. <laughs> so something as simple as a cultural lens of comics shows us the deep underlying complexity in his character and in his persona. Um, in addition, he deployed an image of a sex symbol. For those who are unfamiliar with, with Kissinger's uh, style, he uh, has sort of an incongruous appearance to that sort of a presentation, but he cultivated it actively. And as a scholar of the time, I was very interested in it. It was in this research that I found this transcript in which Nixon admits on Kissinger's behalf to Mao that those cover girls are in fact cover. That his point in being photographed with all these women is not because he's necessarily trying to be a sex symbol, why that is, that's not an unhelpful thing in male-male relationships. What his, pro his fundamental focus here was he could make no progress at secret meetings in Paris if everybody thought he was only in Paris for the party. So a very interesting man who's actually deploying sexuality as secrecy. And in this context, in a humorous one. So I became interested in his aspects of humor, secrecy, seduction, and violence. Speaking of which, he was served with the citizen's arrests by Code Pink at the last Senate Armed Services Committee meeting he attended. So for as much adoration and celebrity, he also has notoriety in our culture appears on Colbert and other TV programs on a regular basis. He has been in the news twice with President Trump since Trump's election. You may have noticed, however, that he was not quoted in any of the materials. His words were not part of the news. His appearance was. So the question of what Kissinger is capable of simply by being is an interesting one, irrespectively, irrespective of the text that he puts out or promulgates. And speaking of the text he chooses to share or not to share, this is a copy of the document I received under FOIA from State Department. This is a copy from his own declassified correspondence. It could be argued from this and other examples that I'll show you that Kissinger had a high stake in maintaining his own legacy actively. The quote that my dissertation title comes from, everything on paper will be used against me, speaks to Kissinger's uh, um, um, circumspection and concern about how this archival material will be remembered in the record. And I was very interested in looking for why that might be and what might have survived uh, the declassification and redaction process that affects government-issued public domain material. But more than anything else, the question of why use these methods, why use this kind of technology for these sorts of research questions, um, the mandate, the so what question, the why bother question, I found answered most closely by John Ehrlichman, who was served in the administration and resigned in disgrace in the Watergate affair. There has been a new release of White House audio tapes and documents just out tonight oh. from the Nixon Library in California. 
Say what you will about it, Richard Nixon is one of the most fascinating figures in American history. Just when we think we know everything there is to know about him, we find out something else. The recordings Richard Nixon intended for his abuse continue to tell history, his uncensored story. The problem is that historians are going to grab a, an hour of tape when these tapes come out. And uh, uh, if you listen to a snippet of tape, you're going to form an impression of this man is going to be wrong. So sometime, hopefully, there will be a historian or a committee of historians who will listen to all the tapes and go into all the archives and then come out and say Richard Nixon was the strangest collection, the strangest paradoxical combination of any man I ever heard of. And they'll be right. So while Ehrlichman is talking there about Nixon, the same applies certainly to Kissinger. And one could argue, in, and I do in my dissertation, that it's even more applicable to someone like Kissinger. Um, so John Ehrlichman tells us that a traditional historical method where we identify selective pieces of evidence across a vast historical archive to substantiate a prior hypothesis may not be the best way to understand the complexities of this person, the complexities of this White House, the complexities of this age. And as he uses it, the paradoxiality of these people, the qualities they have that are internally contradictory. Historians are beginning to grapple with those questions, whereas we come from a tradition that tends to imply rational decision behind all of these actions. So I'm interested in how computational analysis can begin to surface these patterns. Now, uh, this is an important quote. It sort of provides the methodological corollary to Ehrlichman's quote. It's from Joe Gouldy and David Armitage's History Manifesto, which for those of you who are involved with digital humanities is a, uh, a foundational text from 2014, in which they say digitization by itself is not sufficient to break through the fog of stories and the confusion of a society divided by competing mythologies. Kissinger epitomizes that. For every historian who feels that Kissinger acted well within his responsibilities and rights as US National Security Advisor and later Secretary of State, there are other historians who write that Kissinger was a war criminal responsible for secret bombing in Cambodia, overturning democratically elected governments around the world, uh, and that controversy has remained and in fact has only become more entrenched. So as a diplomatic historian seeking my dissertation, PhD, uh, I was especially challenged by the historiographical battle in which I was going to be uh, placing myself. Instead, I took a different angle at it. I sought to approach it computationally and let the chips fall where they may regarding ideological interpretations. That's not to say I'm unbiased. In fact, I'm heavily biased, and every single aspect of the research is deeply biased. It is, however, by understanding that bias or seeking to understand that bias, you can sort of imagine the accuracy of a project like this as a series of factorials, where each would be, in the ideal, would be one. So whatever you had at the beginning, multiply everything by one, by one, by one, by one, it would come out just as pure on the other end. But if you only, say, have 99% accuracy in your text, or you only got 80% of the material that you want to study, you could think of those as multiplying factors, where your end result is going to be lower than one. It won't be ideal. By understanding these approaches in this way, I can tell you comprehensively, I am wrong. I am wrong in every single thing I am showing you to some extent. And my challenge is to understand how wrong, why I'm wrong, and what can be done in a humanistic study approach to overcome those limitations, either in understanding, technology, or availability of evidence. So that's the purpose of my dissertation. And then this second quote is to describe um, what my challenge is. Curating of the data, the questions and the subjects, and to discern and promote questions that are synthetic, relevant, and break new methodological ground. And that's what I hope to walk you through under, uh, in the presentation. So the first thing I would just show you is this. This is sort of represents a lot of these ideas at once. Um, the material that I study is across a nine year time frame. It consists of telcons and memcons. And in fact, I think I might have put this backwards. Did I? Or did I omit a slide? I did. I omitted a slide. Um, I'm sorry. I did. I entirely omitted a slide. Um, this, yeah, I'm sorry I did that. Actually, I'm actually going to open up a slide because there's one that I think is really important to show. And either I put it out of sequence or I omitted it entirely. Yeah, I did. Let me open another one that I know is here. Great. There we go. This is the slide I want to show. 
So this is the source material. This is very important. My apologies for the delay, but this is important. You need to understand the source material, what it is I'm studying before I start to talk about how I study it. In this case, the material consists of two different uh, corpora, corpuses, rather. The memcons and the telcons. The meeting memoranda are highly formatted documents that have lots of proper nouns, lots of identifying country names, last names, first names, full transcripts with headings and descriptions of what takes place. They tend to be rich and longer documents with more text in each one prepared by stenographers, note takers, secretaries, and then distributed amongst all the agencies. Whereas the telecons, the telephone conversations are shorter. They are conversational. They contain abbreviations. Not as many things spelled out or written out. They tend to be uh, actual transcripts of recorded conversations. So the nature of the texts is very different. But moreover, the provenance, the origin, and the background of these texts are very different. Yes? Just a quick question about tele telephone memos. Yes. Was it possible to suppress memos of, of, uh, or recordings of telephone memos? Yes, in fact, I'm going to, uh, that, that's a very important question. It's a really good question. Uh, in the case of the memcons, the research has access to about 2,200 of them. These are formally declassified issued through the varying agencies, and then the final version has been uh, uh, curated, gathered, and metadata assembled at the National Security Archive at George Washington University. The, so those came through a formal government declassification process. When Kissinger left office, he took all of his telephone transcripts with him as his personal papers and refused to provide them to the government under the Presidential Records Act. Uh, only after threat of Supreme Court subpoena in 2005 did Kissinger hand over those over 17,000 telephone transcripts. And he did so en masse uh, and without any understanding by the public about what he may or may not have selectively included or excluded. So interestingly enough, when you look at the provenance of these documents, there is a different expectation of privacy behind these conversations to some extent. Historians may differ about that and say, no, actually Kissinger was probably cynical enough to think that somebody would get those copies of those tape recordings at some point, so he was probably self-editing. Yes, but probably both. And to what extent those two competing realities converged is an important one. If we fear we are being surveilled, that doesn't entirely inhibit us from communicating and sharing. We negotiate with ourselves, our comfort level, and that changes over time. So I was interested in this question of what he intended to preserve, what he intended to suppress, mm -hmm. and how whatever efforts he may have expended were or were not successful in doing so. How can these methods surface those aspects of the text that cannot simply be suppressed by the exclusion of one <coughs> subject matter or one document um, relevant to a, a, a controversial topic? So I will hop back to my actual presentation. So. <coughs> I got all that stuff and I scanned in all of those documents. I actually scraped over 60,000 pages from ProQuest. Uh, and they only let you scrape 500 a day before the webmaster limit blocks you for 24 hours. So I had to write shell scripts that would log me in, download slowly so I didn't overtax any of the download agents on the website, and then back away for 23.59 hours, and then come back and do it again. So four months later, I had all this material and a cease and desist order from ProQuest, but thankfully we worked it out. Um, this research is not for profit, right? It's fair use. My school paid for the access to that database, making s use of web pages that you can go to and browse with your eye, but just doing so a whole lot on an automated basis until you have 50,000 of them, that's sort of a gray area. Now ProQuest prohibits those things more overtly, but I'm happy to report that the arms race continues and students continue to figure out how to get past those obfuscations. So people are still able to access this material and. Uh, according to their interpretation of fair use. So when I scanned in all this stuff, I did something called OCR, which is optical character recognition. You go through each page image and you try to turn that into searchable computer text of the sort you might see in a Word file or the sort that you might be able to search on Google. And when I did so, I then ran a spell check to say how many of the words in this OCR resulting file are spelled correctly versus incorrectly. That's a brute force way of looking at quality, but it gives you some idea of how many words are correctly analyzed in the OCR process, in the telcons and the memcons. And as I looked at the spikes of error percentages, you know, I saw some interesting things. There's more error in the telcons at the beginning, and then it sort of ramps down a little bit. And then there are these punctuating moments of 100% error. 
And I was like, well, what does this, I, I just wanted to know how accurate my OCR was, and now I've got nine more questions to ask. But it turned out, first of all, what it suggested to me is don't start spell checking and proofing and changing the text in these files, because you're going to be here for a very long time if you want all these words to be properly spelled. I was not interested in manually correcting any of this text. Instead, by knowing the percentage of error roughly, I can use that as one of those factorials on my findings and say, with the caveat that my accuracy appears to be 0.96, here is my confidence in my finding. Here's the p-value. Here's the, the coefficient of these two correlating factors. So the other thing was these 100% spikes, which are really fascinating to me. I was like, well, what's going on here? And then when I looked at those documents in more detail, what I realized is those pages were blacked out entirely. Those documents had been reclassified by the government after the publication of the archive. So in fact, I had a finding aid to the stuff that they pulled back that resulted from a simple word count and spell check operation in a computational approach. So sometimes the noise, the dirt, the, the, the nasty data is extremely useful. You don't throw the stuff out. So I, I show this to, to talk about errors and I talk about sort of embracing your accuracy, but also because there is serendipitous value in a lot of these things. And if you can sort of give yourself enough permission not to have to prove to yourself how important what you're doing is at every moment, play can be very rewarding. And even though this was a technical question, I played with that question and it turned out to be useful. So here's the scraping process, as I mentioned before. On the original Digital National Security Archive website, it was a table of uh, rows where each metadata is a row with the, essentially the name of the metadata field and then the content of the metadata field. So I scraped down each page, grabbed each HTML file, rotated it sideways, turned it into one row of the database, and plunked it into Microsoft Excel. And I use Excel because it's so ubiquitous. It's much easier for me to do this in Excel and then have students use it or have this be available in the future than maybe a MySQL database or some other database structure. I can do that also, and I do, for performance reasons and other reasons. But Excel is so ubiquitous that for preservation concerns and for future concerns, it's often good, even though it's proprietary, to have an alternative available in a tool that has been already around for over 25 years. Um, so once I scraped the stuff down, I had my PDFs, I had computer-readable text, and I had metadata in a table with a direct correlation. So there's a document that corresponds to every row of my data file. So the first thing I did was to start reading this text. But I didn't start by close reading it. I started by distant reading it. I used a technique called topic modeling. For those of you who aren't familiar with topic modeling, what it does, uh, I've captured here in a, in a, in a representation. It goes through the text and looks for the occurrences of words. And then when those words happen frequently together in the same texts, it says, oh, this text is about this. And the text is about this to this amount. So if we look at the text on this page, we can see that it involves a meeting between Presidents Nixon and Chiu about US military commitments in North and South Vietnam. We read that and we conclude that. The computer doesn't look for meaning. It simply counts the words. And then it, call, it, it identifies how those words can be best delineated into n clusters. In this case, I chose 40, because there had been another project done on a similar volume of text that used 40 topics. And frankly, I just thought that was a good idea. I wasn't going to push my limit and have 100 of these things to understand. I just picked 40. Sometimes you can make some arbitrary choices. And if you understand their impact, you can move on. In this case, this document generated these four topics. I did not choose these topics. I did not choose these words. I didn't choose these names. I didn't assign the percentages. It saw the frequency of words and said, oh, this document is about North, South, Chia, Vietnam. 38% weighted towards that topic. It's 10% weighted towards US-Nixon relations, 8% weighted towards Soviet to Britain, and 7.6% related to air military forces. So those topics describe the content, but they do so through a different method than the mind of a human being does. So that provides some interesting benefits because I didn't have to close read the document to get these weights and these values. But it also means I don't understand the narrative of the text. I don't necessarily understand the nuance of the arguments being made. So there are other ways to start to get at those questions. But a distant reading doesn't look for nuance and narrative. It looks for focus and content and the shift in time over the, uh, in content and, and, and focus. And as an historian, ultimately, that's as important to me as those momentary incidences of nuance that I can build a, a, an hypothesis around. So as an interesting demonstration of what, how accurate topic modeling can be, 
This archive, as I said, has been curated by the archivists at the National Security Archive. Every single document has been read by another scholar. They have put metadata in this table of, of a database of information. So I'm able to look at the words my computer topic model generated and compare them to the text created by the librarians of the archive. And I've colored corresponding topics between the computer generated <coughs> words and the human generated archival list. There's a high corroboration between these two lists. But I, I, I say this every time I talk about it, and I say this double when I went to the National Security Archive to talk to them about it. This does not, in any way, suggest that the human labor was redundant or unnecessary. Quite the opposite. Only by having access to that material can I even understand how accurate these tools can possibly be. This is not about replacing human labor. It's about maximizing the value of that labor across an incredibly vast scope of material. So, visualization. When I have all these weights, and I have 18,000 documents across eight years, 40 topics, line graphs are a logical place to start. What's the frequency of a topic over time? Historians love timelines. We love to put the time on X. That's sort of what we're all about. And it's one way to do it, and you have to do it. There are a lot of other ways to do it, but as an example, when I took my 40 topics and I visualized them in just very simply in Excel, and I think this was 2012 when I did this, um, I saw different frequencies over time for different topics. And when you zoom in, in particular on the Cambodia topic, for example, I illustrated historically meaningful events on a timeline that, as an historian, I was familiar with. For example, Kent State and the controversy in the US over the, 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 the public revelations of the bombing in Cambodia. The beginning and end of the Paris peace talks around the turn of 72 to 73. And then the fall of Saigon and Phnom Penh. So the question of how the topic model frequencies correlate to historical moments in the record and how topic model frequencies can serve as finding aids to this archive. If you look for a specific topic and you're interested in the frequency of issues around discussions in Greece and Tur around Greece matters in Greece and Turkey, in this case the Cyprus uh, coup, you see it towards the end of the archive. Whereas, for example, when you're looking at some of the SALT talks, or, again, that Vietnam talk, uh, the Vietnam uh, negotiations, they tend to be in the middle of the archive in 72, 73. But you're looking at one line graph at a time. And this is all the same text. So I'm interested in how these frequencies map to one another. In this case, I grab five topics that are related to the war in Vietnam from, from my own interpretation of the words that those topics conform, uh, or, uh, comprise. Cambodia, oh, there's a fly here. <laughs> Hot fly. Oh, it's on the projector, ha uh ha. -huh. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, Cambodia, it's warm, I bet. Um, Cambodia, North South Chair Vietnam, T1, who was a, a Parama envoy in the negotiations, late October agreement, and negotiations. There's obviously a correlation in the historical record between these five topics. The, the peaks correlate at interesting times in the record. So this tells me that out of my 40 topics, five of them relate to the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War is an important subject in this archive. And I can look at the historical record and look at these correlations. But again, we're still looking at five line graphs, one stacked vertically on top of the other. It's when you use a richer visualization capability to show all 40 line graphs as monthly summarized bar graphs in one false perspective that you see more patterns emerge. For example, when I looked at this document, at this visualization, the first thing I saw was there's a real interesting threshold in the density. It sort of starts out sparse, with a few exceptions, but then, you know, whatever it is, uh, three-fifths of the way through, there's this real burst of activity that takes place, and from here on out, the memcons, which is what this visualization represents, tend to explode in the diversity of topics and how much material is generated. Kissinger was promoted from National Security Advisor to Secretary of State in September 1973. So his official duties change, and his correspondence necessarily changes drastically as a result. So in fact, not knowing about my subject, I become interested in what happened in September 1973. Why was it so determinative? As a, as a, as a scholar who might, just beginning, who might be just beginning to interact with this archive, that might be a place I start. Maybe I'd write an essay about the impact of Kissinger's promotion on the, architect, uh, on the operations of the administration. Um, so just by visualizing these and looking at them in concert, we start asking other questions. And here are my Vietnam topics I was just looking at again. 
So this visualization recapitulates there's this similarity going on in the middle. There are other events that are really interesting, like, you know, what's, what's this and this? This is the Middle East conflict, as we'll say. Now, as I mentioned, there are two corpora, the corpuses. Half the people say corpora, half the people say corpuses, and yell at me if I say corpora. There are two bodies of text, the memcons and the talcons. <laughs> um, what I'm interested in is the, com the uh, comparative capabilities of these methods. So when I do the same analysis on the memcons and the talcons, here's the talcons visualization. We see sort of an opposite pattern. There's more going on in the beginning. Then we've got these two interesting sort of moments, and then a big mountain of blue, whereas we had a couple mountain ranges of other colors. But it looks a little different. And it looks sort of inverse to the last one. So logically, let's stack them both, and let's ask about this as one visualization across the entire archive of correspondence, 18,000 documents across eight years. And when you look at this visualization, the first thing you think of is, wow, he was working the phones more as national security advisor than he was as secretary of state. Something happened to reduce his use of the telephone when he became secretary of state. He went on the record. He was no longer free to have the same kinds of confidential conversations as Secretary of State that he did as National Security Advisor. But he was still National Security Advisor until 1975. So there's this overlap when he is using both, but his behavior really shifts. Also really interesting in this visualization are two other things. First of all, you see this spike of activity going on uh, in the telcons, and then you see this spike of activity going on in the memcons. This is in uh, September, October 73. This is in May 1974. And what's happening there is what we refer to as the shuttle diplomacy during the Middle East conflict of 73 to 74. War breaks out. Egypt, Israel, and Syria are at war. Kissinger works the phones. He gets involved with all the different participants from Egyptians to Syrians to Jordanians. And then by the time May comes around, he's in person. And he's actually traveling via plane to these places to resolve the, the conflict. And this volume of material are the memos generated from those peace meetings. So you can see that the use of the phones at the beginning of the process, the use of the memos at the end of the process, brackets this period of intense activity in the Middle East conflict. That's one way to see this stuff. But it's not the only way to see it. And interestingly enough, you can use other methods of visualization to surface this. This is the same data we were just looking at. This is a three-dimensional terrain, as if we could move around that false perspective on uh, architecture. So one of my projects in the dissertation is a VR component, where all these visualizations are rendered in 3D, and you can actually place yourself in the visualization and ask questions about distance and locality. Um, but these are all sorts of line graphs of one sort or another. Even this stream graph, this is a sort of stacked series of what are called area graphs with a dial that changes based on the month. And these are all visible on my website. You're welcome to check them out. But what I've been uh, interested in demonstrating uh, is actually another way of rendering the same data. This is something called Gephi. It's a network analysis tool. I'm going to just very briefly show you the data that underlies this visualization. When we look at the data, uh, it's actually not super easy to see, but these are, this is the same data table that we were looking at in Excel. It's every document is a row. Um, and the weights from the topics to the documents are represented as what are called edges in a network visualization. So each node is a document or a topic. And a document is connected or weighted to, a, a document is weighted to a topic according to a certain weight from 0 to 1. So each of those distances, which are recognized as weight here, when you run the visualization, distributes the nodes into this interesting cluster. And the cluster, let me zoom the text, let me put the text on the labels and I'll zoom it out a little bit. This is the, the landscape of 40 topics. And it is a three-dimensional network rather than a two-dimensional network. So when you're able to, you can actually um, move within it, filter it, et cetera. But it's the timeline capabilities that I'm really most interested in. Uh, let's actually just go to QuickTime, and I will show you what I mean. Okay, that's that. And then here we go. So this is that, essentially that same visualization. It's a little bit different than the one I showed you, but it's the same idea. It's a network of documents to topics. Now. You can use the timeline capability to filter the display. This is all nine years. This is an aggregate view. But as I mentioned before, historians are often interested in change over time. 
So when you filter down the demonstration to a three month period, and then you play it back starting in 1968, you see that at the beginning of the archive, there's sort of a, a sparse amount of activity, but Cambodia, Soviet Union appear early, as does Vietnam, three secret and the negotiations topics. Oh, and this is hard to read here, but this is 1971 that has just started. And from 71 to 72, we see this predominance of blue coloration in the upper left. Blue refers to documents that were top secret. Yellow refers to documents that were secret. And as time goes by, these documents that correlate mostly with the Vietnam War then shift, and by 1974, the focus of the administration is down here on the Middle East topics, Egypt, the Mideast, etc. And so while I'm looking at the exact same data, I'm able to perceive those changes and peaks month to month instead in my own perceived real time. I'm looking at that as a movie. In other words, my experience of our time, universal time, the viewer's time, is here being mapped to the progression of time in the archive. So by using a visualization like that, I can then use color blue and yellow, to show how classification relates to those changes in topics. What it represents is, when the US was in Vietnam, the US was a direct military participant. So those conversations tend to be top secret, blue in this upper left corner. But as time goes by and the Vietnam War ostensibly resolves, one could argue it really doesn't resolve for quite some time afterwards. But by then, oh, let me stop this. Uh, but by then, at that point in the archive, a predominance of yellow. So by simply representing something like as easy as metadata of classification status using color, you're able to do some interesting stuff. This is a sort of a, a bigger version of the other, of the topic model document. It's every single individual document and subject across the entire archive, I think 38,000 elements, as one big cloud as sort of an astronomical constellation. So my challenge there is sort of navigating through it. Um, but that shows the idea in a nutshell. And again, there's my graph. And it shows me this blue arc in the upper left relating to US military commitments, and this yellowish area in the lower right relating more to congressional and diplomatic activity. Um, but what I'm interested more than anything else, as I said, as an historian, is change over time. So how can I visualize uh, change over time in a useful way? In this case, I made a subjective choice. I was interested in the question of bombing. Right? Kissinger is pretty well known for the bombing of Cambodia. He's notorious for it. I was interested in how the word bombing and bombs and bomb occurred in the archive. And sort of when they're talking about bombing, which happened fairly frequently, what are they talking about? So I did something called the word collocation analysis. I started with the word bombing and then using text analysis tools. Here is a GUI for one of these tools. It's called AntConc. You can do this in a tool called NLTK, which is a text analysis tool in the command line. There. Uh, you can also do it in R. R is a really great language for uh, using some of these tools. I asked, every single time the word bombing occurs, what words happen 10 words before it, and what words happen 10 words after it across the entire archive? Give me every occurrence of the word. Maybe that'll give me some idea of what they're talking about when they talk about bombing. So I, the resulting data came down, and I visualized it, and it was a really deep, dense cluster of stuff with a couple of very notable exceptions. So I then did more research, but essentially I include this graph because it's so illegible. You can't really read the text. You, all you can see is there's this cluster of noise, and there are a couple of other dots. But when I looked at it in detail, what I realized was, well, first of all, if a word, well, you know, one step back. Let me talk about what collocation specifically is. It's different than frequency. If I search for a text, a word in the text, and there are 9,000 occurrences of it, it'll say it occurred 9,000 times. But if a word like the occurs 9,000 times in a search, how meaningful is that? It can sort of overwhelm what I'm searching for. So collocation asks, when a word is found within the range I'm looking for of my target word, how uniquely is it found in that range, rather than everywhere else in the document? So how, how frequently uniquely found are these words? And that was my measurement. This visualization shows those words in a really dense, illegible cluster. The green line would be an ideal case where the word is uniquely co-located with the word bombing in the memcons and the telcons with no difference. If a word occurs above the line, it's more unique in the telcons. And if a word occurs below the line, it's more unique in the memcons. And these words are Cambodia, Cambodians, Vietnamese, and Vietnam. 
None of the other words are geopolitical in this cluster. I didn't choose them. The computer told me what those words are. But bombing of Vietnam and Cambodia was a frequent topic. But I was interested in why bombing in Vietnam co-located so uniquely in the memcons, remember, formerly declassified discussions, whereas bombing in Cambodia uniquely co-located so much more frequently in the telcons, which Kissinger claimed is his personal papers. And for those of you who recall, the bombing of Vietnam, of North Vietnam, was congressionally sanctioned. The bombing of Cambodia was, was specifically uh, prohibited by Congress. And so the so-called illegal bombing of Cambodia became an interesting question for me to understand just how much of an expectation of privacy did Kissinger actually have. And after surrendering this material, how representative of, this, of his attitude or his conversations could this material still be? Turns out fairly, fairly a lot, in fact. Um, the first, this visualization was another way of visualizing the same cluster of illegibility that we were just looking at. In this case, I use another network diagram. And what this represents is, this is the word bombing when it's found on the phone. This is the word bombing when it's found in the memos. If a word is uniquely co-located with both corpora to the word bombing to some extent, it's in this gray cluster. This big word right here is halt. The phrase bombing halt was quite popular. It was a diplomatic term involving the cessation of bombing to accomplish a diplomatic or military end. So it took place in the phone. It wasn't particularly controversial. Uh, and in fact, uh, bombing halts were often seen as a way to gain public approval. So it's unsurprising it's such a frequent uh, word and found in both corpuses. But if a word is only uniquely co-located in the memos, it occupies this cluster. And if the word is only uniquely co-located in the telcons, it appears in this cluster. Now, when I went through and I read these 4,000 words, what I found was, and I want to put out a caveat here before I switch to the next slide. My apologies to anyone who might have color perception uh, uh, differences. If there's anyone here who is what is uh, re referred to vernacularly as colorblind, let me know and I can show you this visualization in a cycling way that shows what I'm talking about here, but doesn't rely on what, what I'm going to show here, which is a green-red uh, perception. But I went through and I found all the words related to Vietnam and all the words related to Laos, Indochina, or Laos Thailand, and Cambodia. So the dots that are green are words related to Vietnam, ostensibly legal bombing. The words related to Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand are words related to Cambodia, or words uh, that are related to ostensibly illegal bombing. And when you look at this pattern, again, it's aggregate across the entire time frame, and it crosses 4,000 words across 18,000 plus documents. You can see that the green dots tend to be distributed pretty much across the whole visualization, with maybe you could say a little more to the right, but across both. But the red dots are overwhelmingly found on one side rather than on the other side. Um, now, this is just a visualization of this data, but it's suggestive of the idea that when he's talking about bombing legally, it's in the memos. When he's talking about bombing illegally, it's in the telephone conversations, which is suggestive of the idea that at the time he did have an expectation to some extent of privacy on the telephone. So this is a way of getting at a, co a quantitative demonstration of that theory. But as I said, historians are all about change over time. So it was necessary to go past an aggregate view and look at this on the timeline. How does this change over time? And that's what I did. The frequency of the word Cambodia is in blue. The frequency of the word bombing is in orange. This is the telcons, and this is the memcons. Sometimes the clusters correlate pretty closely. Sometimes they don't, and you see one color and you don't see the other. Um, but whenever the two words bombing and Cambodia happen in the same document, irrespective of the distance, that was a notable thing for my first step of the research. So I visualized every single point in the timeline as a drop mark. Now, when I looked at this visualization, I thought, I can't really read this visualization. It's visually too complex. There's too many of these lines. But what can I read? Well, there's a bit of alternativity. When we see a cluster in one corpus, we tend to see a gap below it or above it in the other corpus. Not all the time, but sometimes. And there tends to be times where it's frequent and times where it's less frequent. And that happens demonstrably across the timeline. But when I'm looking for meaning, the distance between the words is important. It, I can't just consider any distance. I really want to know about bombing Vietnam or bombing Cambodia, which you could describe as a zero distance. So I map the distance between the words as diamonds on this zero axis of the graph. 
In the telcons, if the words bombing Cambodia are right next to each other, that diamond is on the zero line of each of the graphs. Similarly with the memcons. And when you look at this, a different and much more uh, telling picture presents itself. As you can see, in the bottom, in the memcons, the words bombing in Cambodia across, uh, occur across a wide distance of words, whether zero or a thousand. And they do so across a wide range of times. There are some gaps, and there are some correlations with historically meaningful events, like, as I mentioned, Phnom Penh and Saigon, the peace talks, Kent State, etc. But the telcons are much more focused. Those diamonds occur much closer to the zero line, and they occur in much more constrained segments of the timeline, suggestive that when he's on the phone, and the words bombing in Cambodia happen. He's talking about bombing Cambodia. He's not just talking about bombing, comma, oh, and also Cambodia. In this case, it's quite demonstrative, not only of a tendency, but then it starts asking you this question about like, why was there so much activity around bombing Cambodia so late in August 1973, for example. Now, at the time, that's the Watergate trials, which started as an investigation of the bombing of Cambodia. And when you go back and use this as a close reading finding aid, and you say, all right, I'm going to read every document that each diamond comes from, and I'm really going to understand those documents. What you see is, much like the cover girls, Kissinger is not talking necessarily about what he did in 1969, 1970. He's, one, uh, making a new bombing effort that is more public to demonstrate to Congress that they never meant to keep it secret which was an interesting thing. They actually, during the trial, they, they renewed the bombing of Cambodia to somehow prove it had never been, they never tried to keep it secret. But moreover, he's talking about how he's going to cover his ass in these trials and how they're going to talk about the bombing of Cambodia and defend the administration. So it serves as a really interesting way to get at some of these questions and tell me what dates on which certain conversations took place without the close reading. So that is one sort of series of visualizations. As you recall, I started out with you know, a, uh, an illegible scatter plot and a table of data. I started next, or, or then I next did a network diagram that visualized the same data differently to help me understand it a little differently. Then I identified important words within it that either could include or exclude what I was beginning to consider a theory about this archive. Then I put it on a timeline so I could understand how situational these changes were happening. Then I identified commonalities and where those words were happening together, then how far those words were happening from each other, approximating meaning. It's not meaning, right? It's different than meaning. So it's a pointer, it's an indicator, it's a trend, it's a way of looking en masse at the long durée of this archive and coming up with some new ways to understand it. Last, show your math. So if you're doing digital humanities in particular, and your audience are historians or classicists or people who aren't familiar necessarily with the underlying statistical analysis, at least show the math that underlies your calculations. And in this case, for Vietnam words and for Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand words, the average co-location between the telcons and the memcons, as I mentioned earlier, is roughly the same. Those green dots were happening roughly in both halves of the diagram at the same time. But the red ones are most certainly more heavily correlated to the telecom. So that is sort of uh, a series of visualizations. And actually, this is an important sort of observation I'll make. And I think I may be getting close to the end here. Oh, good, I've got 10 minutes. So maybe I'll, I'll wrap it up and we can talk about questions for the last 10 minutes. But so, you know, if more than anything else, what I sort of have attempted to show here is <clears throat> that the, that the epistemological process is different when you do this sort of thing, right? It, as I said before, you don't start with a theory, cherry pick evidence, support it, and then argue it in a journal somewhere. It's a different way of getting at the knowledge. It's trying to drink from the fire hose. And as Je Jesse mentioned, um, historians of our moment in the future are going to be studying us and the decisions we made or the actions we took, whether conscious or whether rational or otherwise, on the basis of a huge volume of data that we didn't necessarily choose to share or present or curate. They are not going to be writing essays about our lives. They're going to be studying our communication patterns and looking at the text of what we contribute to this vast archive. And they're only going to be able to understand it to get down to the level of hearing what we said and what we meant by penetrating an archive of that size using methodologies like this. So 
Kissinger, as I mentioned, this sort of this inflection point in history where there's just enough data to do what I needed to do. And moreover, I'm on a pretty old Mac here. It's a 2011 MacBook Air, and I love it because it's got all my stickers out. I don't want to change. Um, but so that has also been a limitation on that, some of the research I could do. I do my 3D and visualization stuff on a richer, more capable laptop. But as a graduate student, one of my challenges is just get it done already, right? Don't take, don't keep turning it into your magnum opus. Deliver a dissertation and then contribute to the larger field. So in this case, the materiality, the limitations of my computer, the limitations of the archive, or the limitations of my own understanding have actually been welcome constraints in what could be this open-ended, uh, quixotian uh, uh, quest. So. Uh, in any case, that's my research. Uh, I'd be happy to throw it open for questions at this point. Thank you guys very much. And uh, look forward to your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes? Uh, would it be possible to use your methodology to get more insights, insight into Russian meddling into <laughs> social media in the United States and um, the influence it had on the election? Hypothetically, absolutely. Uh, practically, I have no recall of that, Senator. <laughs> uh, yes? Um, this is really great. Thank you for sharing um, your work with us. Um, I wonder, from your visual visualization, can you just kind of tell us how this manifests in, unfortunately, a written document or what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the battle. I, I know. That's like, the yeah. battle. And here's my stake in the battle. I think I may have uh, launched myself on my own catapult to some extent, so I'm hoping I can survive the impact, but I think it's going to be a successful hit. Here's, the, here's what I'm doing. First of all, what I just did is I showed you slides containing visualization, and I provided prose along with it. You were looking at the visualizations and hearing me talk. Sometimes you might have looked at me while I was talking, but by and large, you were hearing my words, looking at the visualizations, and then sort of critiquing and questioning, do I see what she sees? Or does that argument pertain to my perception? That's how I want to deliver my dissertation. So I'm flipping the model. Instead of visualization, well, yeah, and this, this is the, the, the other thing I'll say before I say this. Um, I don't use the word visualization often as a noun. I tend to use it as a verb. It's this hermeneutic cycle where you do one visualization, an image, a graphic, that provokes questions. And then you ask, well, how would I suss out possible interpretations of that for accuracy? And then you do another visualization. And then the cycle turns, and you do another one. So it's actually a process. It's this verb. So if that's the knowledge community, if that's how the knowledge creation process is going on, a sequence of visualizations that may branch into three different thought experiments that may internally contradict or something. If I'm asking someone to come out of that and read black text in Times New Roman 12 point on white paper, they're automatically going to lose my argument. Mm -hmm. So instead, for my dissertation, I hope to deliver not figures within a monograph, but text as figures within a visualization space. And what I'm going to use for that architecture is a tool called Unity. It's a game engine, and you can do 2D and 3D visualization. But my goal is to put all these, as I've already started, into Unity write a script and take my dissertation descriptive text, create chapters in that space, and let people play back my argumentation, pause it, and interrogate the model themselves. That is my goal. And the, if I do it right, I can actually just use a style sheet and export all that text as a white paper. So we'll see how well that plays out. Yeah? Uh, when you were doing this research, were there many times when you felt discouraged I would think it would be absolutely overwhelming. It looks like they just lied and lied and lied. And lied. I mean, what, what, how did you feel after a very tough day? I mean, did you ever yeah. feel like giving it up permanently? Yeah. Um, wow. So yes, that's a, that's yeah. a, that, is, that, that was yeah. a syndrome. Um, yeah, there, there are a couple aspects of that. First of all, yes, absolutely. It's, it's dispiriting to read documents now that just are, are, are plain proof of some of the most cynical interpretations at the time of some of these world events. I've read transcripts where Kissinger says, I want the body count. I want dead Cambodians. That's how they know I'm serious at the negotiating table. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen him say, it's a pleasure to bomb those North Vietnamese sons of bitches. 
So when you encounter somebody speaking that frankly, as an historian, it's easy to take a subjectively negative interpretation, but it's also my job not to judge him per se. I have to understand why he's saying that and deploying that. And frankly, as I didn't get a chance to speak to too much in the research, but I, I do in the dissertation, uh, some of that talk was deployment of male uh, uh, sexuality, this sort of homosocial male competition where there is a kind of a violence contest going on. Trench humor is a way that men show their internal strength to one another. Um, and the sexuality that we saw on display with the models and all of that was public appearances. The diplomatic meetings would start and it would all be about whatever party Kissinger had been in. So I'm interested in that. It's dispiriting, but it's fascinating. And as soon as you get past that and you ask yourself, so am I learning something new? If I, if I stomach this enough and contextualize it enough, can I actually contribute to the field of knowledge? So that, that drove me more than, than, than the disgust. But yeah, it's tough. It's really tough when you when you read stuff like this. Oh, and I, I just want to add one more thing. Uh, some years ago when I was in book publishing, we received a manuscript from John Ehrlichman called The Company about Richard Nixon and the CIA. Anyway, the portrait he drew of President Richard Moncton, as he called him, and I forget what he called Kissinger, however, it is absolutely spot on in terms of both men. Nixon is, a, Moncton is given a report and he says to Kissinger, is this one of those lantern-jawed faggots from the state? Sure. Yeah, I mean, and you may you may know the quote of his where he says, "Well, all the Greeks were fags. That's how the, they, that's why they fell." Yeah, yeah. So I would love to, to talk more yeah, and hear more about yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah. But that is a wonderful book. It may still be out of you know out of print. Great. But I think with the renewed interest, people are going to say, "Let's go back to that book." The that's company. great. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look for that. Thank you. Yes. Um, so thank you. Fascinating. Pleasure, so many sure. things on the day after Liz Smith died. You know, they were big buds. <laughs> um, and this morning on NPR, they interviewed someone about the Mueller investigation, talking about writing his comments on on uh, index cards and then throwing them away at the end of the day so as not to leave any traces. Yeah. Um, but I just want to, I mean, I, I missed um, Jesse's introduction. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to know how you came to this part to doing your research this way? It was a long and <laughs> difficult time uh, experience. Actually, uh, interestingly enough, <clears throat> I started doing this work after I met Kissinger. I was part of a global strategy seminar at Columbia, um, and we had the occasion to have a visit with the Secretary of State. So we're all sitting in this well-appointed conference room at, at Columbia. It's the one that has its own cops with the name of the conference room on the China. Um, <laughs> And so we're all sitting in there, and all of a sudden the doors swing open, and these two guys in suits and earpieces come in, and they say, the secretary is about to enter. Please rise. Oh. Now, like he's Judge Wapner. <laughs> like, you don't do that. That's not protocol. You don't have to rise when the former secretary of state enters the room. But we did. And I was interested in that. And then the Kissinger came in, and he sort of made his way to the table, and he stood at the table and there we were and he sat down and we all sat down and he leaned across the table and he said to us, I won't do a, a kiss of your impression, but you can't not. Um, and he leaned forward and he said, so, who has brought questions for the answers I've prepared? <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I had to study him. I knew I had to study him. So I, I then started this work. You know, this was 2011 and that's when I started the work and I said, all right, how am I going to study this guy? And I thought I'd compare this correspondence to his autobiography and see sort of how common they were. And then I realized, no, he would have relied on his correspondence for his autobiography because it wasn't that useful. So he focused solely on the correspondence. That's sort of how I came at Kissinger. But how I came at digital humanities in this work is also interesting. I'm a Simons rocker. Oh, I was a Simons rocker. Um, so in 85, I left high school and I went to Simons Rock. I did two years at this school. And I got an associate's degree and I got the hell out of academia. Uh, I was a musician at the time, I still am, but I became a recording engineer and I did a bunch of recording projects, but I found that the core of the entire arc of this work has been my Macintosh. 
I had an early Mac, one, 1984 Mac, like the first one. My parents were incredibly prescient, generous, and, and fed up enough to get me one. Um, and I found that that skill set, the idea of thinking about computation as something that can be affected rather than a blinking command line to be conquered, that you could push a pixel rather than having to command it, was a very interesting experience for me. So I started out in music on computers, and then I moved to desktop publishing as the laser printer came out in the late 80s to pre-press as images and Photoshop became more and more capable, and then into software project management. So I was a software project manager at Chase in 2005, working in banking software, just ready to just, I said to myself, I could close my eyes and open them and I'd be 67 and a half, ready to retire with an associate's degree. I might as well get my bachelor's degree. And so I decided I would find the limit of my intellect by going back to school. And so that's what I did, and I've been in school ever since. Mm -hmm. so. Yes? Um, so most of what you've talked about is just reading of vocabulary, of words. Yes. And I'm curious about whether you think, or if you've used this way of looking at data to look at patterns with iconography or images or pictures. Interesting. Particularly with you know, what comes through in pop culture versus sort of um, elite culture. Yeah, that's fascinating. I have not done that with photographs, but there was one interesting thing that might speak to the spirit of the question rather than necessarily being about multimedia or about images, um, and that is sort of the material culture of the materials themselves, the material origins of these documents. Um, you may recall when I showed you this visualization, I mentioned there are, are, are fewer but more prominent mountains of topics in the telcons than the mincons. So I looked at what those topics were, and I'm going to go back to that other slide I showed you to illustrate what they are. And that's this. In the memcons, as I said, they're highly rich text with lots of country names, lots of proper nouns. The conversational archives are much less detailed with that. However, uh, and the text is conversational and tends to be sort of repetitive and very similar. The classification stamp, however, is ubiquitous on each of these 18,000 documents. So for example, every declassified document, every unclassified, every confidential document has the same stamp. So when I did a word analysis of those documents, it was the stamp of the declassification that was the most prominent differentiator between those documents. So something that was added to the document during the declassification process became the most telling aspect of that text for me to research. It's a, it's a sort of a sideways response to the question. Um, one thing I have done also is a sonification, where I've taken the same word collocation data and turned it into a, a song of sorts. It's a three-minute audio piece. So you hear every time the word bombing happens in the two correspondences with audio clips of press conferences to tell you where in the historical archive you are. So I've, I've leveraged some of those things, but I've not done an image analysis uh, per se, and, and that would be a fascinating uh, aspect. Yes. Just to add on to that, just this month, uh, Franco Moretti published an article doing image analysis based on these principles of Barber's, um, Amy Barber's uh, Atlas images. So he was trying to do specifically an image analysis using these principles. Awesome. Kind of interesting. Awesome. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. I just had a, a, a telephonic uh, structural question. It, it looks like you may have discovered a difference between phones at the National Security Council and phones in the State Department. And, and I just wondered whether you've actually probed back in, in somebody must know how, uh, how uh, <laughs> public or unpublic they are in the, in the two places. Yeah. And, and, and is, is that part of what you're seeing in, the, in, 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 in how Kissinger responded? Yeah. He didn't believe that his phone conversations were nearly as private at the State Department as he, as he, as he assumed they were uh, at the National Security. I, 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 I think that's absolutely true. In fact, before he took, before he Nixon took office, um, there's a lot of correspondence of his when he was consulting with previous administrations and as a scholar, um, and none of that stuff is generally available through the Washington Special Actions Group, for example. Mm -hmm. So there were entire channels of communication that are simply absent here. Absolutely correct. Moreover, presidential libraries hold copies of some of this material as well. So there's a whole tranche of materials at the Ford Library that's an interesting corollary to this, but it's not technically his correspondence. It's either group meetings or group conversations that he was a participant in, but that his office did not coordinate. So that also uh, escapes this analysis. 
would you be able to measure how much manipulation there was, for instance, in the in the, the memos of uh, the uh, conference? Uh, yeah. By comparing with the phone. Uh, yeah, that's a, the, there are a couple of really interesting possible avenues for that kind of approach. First of all, you may remember on that page I showed of the topic model text, there were a couple of words that were. Um, handwritten or struck out, for example, and some corrections on the page. When we read that with close reading, we read that and we see what it means, or it may be illegible handwriting, but you understand what's going on. When the computer tries to analyze that, it's just noise. It comes up with garbage characters in the text. But by looking for incidents of garbage characters, you can actually find documents that are more heavily marked up. So just as those error frequencies were useful to show me redacted or, or, repressed or suppressed documents, I can also look at those aggregate percentages and look for hand marked up memos, which is an interesting sort of use of that capability as well. But your question getting to how useful perhaps the audio transcripts could be in conjunction with some of these written documents and analyzing the difference in redaction between the source materials, yeah, there are, there are a lot of different levels at which you can do that. There's an online resource called the Declassified Documents Retrieval System. And it allows you to look for all of the different agency variations of the same document and analyze page by page what is and isn't redacted in each one. And moreover, you can go one step further and say, well, if they redacted it here and this agency didn't redact it, and this is the nature of the text that I know is here, how can I guess at what the other redacted stuff is? Right? What kinds of stuff got redacted by which agencies? So there's a lot of that kind of capability, and that tends to be cluster level computing. It seems like that it, it, being in control of, of the phone and the, the memos uh, simultaneously allows you to manipulate, the memos allow you to manipulate other departments of government That's right. and to, to, to give them a, a perception that they're in the know when they're not really in the know. Yes, yeah, so a famous uh, uh, quote about Kissinger, um, I think it's Isaacson, or it might have been Keyes who said this, who said, Kissinger seduced you with secrecy. He let you think he was making you aware of something that no one else knew, and in so doing, he had gotten you, he had ensnared you. So it often, he often would deploy those sorts of redactable moments as ways of cementing alliances towards his own end. So yeah, that's a, that, that, you see that pattern all over the place. So I'll ask one question, then I guess. We, uh, if anybody has any follow-ups, please uh, feel free to yep. stay a little bit longer. Um, I think this is really uh, provoking a lot of thought made about our current practices and how we're keeping records now, particularly with our, with our tweeter in chief. Um, it is interesting that these are public, yet uh, on a commercial platform, and also ephemeral in a way that is, you know, posting things self-redacting them almost from our record, even though people managed to preserve almost all of his redacted uh, tweets. It is interesting in compar comparison to this, which is a lasting record of uh, documents. I'm sure not, there's many other things like private conversations that do, do not get recorded, but um, the challenges we'll face going forward in trying to gain access to large amounts of data that you, if a company, for instance, like Twitter, were to go out of business mm -hmm. or um, delete their records or if anything nefarious were going on. As we know, they've already done. Yeah. So I think that even this looking at this raises so many uh, important questions about uh, um, the moment we're in right now. I wonder if you're, if that's the same thing that's occurred to you or as you're doing this. Is it hard to stay in the past? Mm -hmm. Um, and think about these, even though you're using modern technologies and thinking through them with these. Is it hard to distance yourself from the present moment when you're looking at this past? And well, as an American who considers myself to be somewhat politically aware, or at least to be a member, a, a participating member in a democracy, um, it has been a difficult year. Um, in this year, I have seen very troubling signs of a diminishment of our democratic freedom, of the sort of overreach of the presidency, of deeply concerning issues around foreign intervention in our government and in our electoral system. Uh, it has been very difficult for me to stay in the past as the last year has unfolded. However, these people were quaint in comparison yeah. to what we're dealing with now. <laughs> so if anything, this is a sort of a respite for me. It's a way that I can practice my skills, maybe hone some of these questions. 
I will at least go one step further than my non-response response and say I do have a Trump database. Um, I was a fellow at the State Department and Trump canceled that program. So I'm not exactly sure in what way that these skills will be leveraged, whether in public, uh, institutional hands, or whether by private citizens. But yeah, it, um, this is the only way we're going to begin to get at some of the kinds of things that are happening right now that will echo in our lives for a long time. So not the only way. This is an important way that we'll need to, to address those. So I'm, I'm committed to it. Thank you so much. No Thank you. Thank you.